Now we'll talk about the fundamentals of disease spread. This one's going to be a little bit mathematical, but stick with me, it's worth it. So at a high level, the dynamic behavior of infectious disease in a population is understood using the SIR model. So we define variables S, I, and R, where S is the population of susceptible people, people who don't have immunity, who haven't contracted the disease yet. I is the population of people who are infected and can spread the disease. And R is the population of people who've either recovered from the disease or have died from it. The rate at which new infections occur, or in other words, the change in infections per unit time is proportional to the number of people who are presently infected times the number of people who are susceptible, or in particular, the fraction of the population who is currently susceptible, divided by some constant minus the rate at which people recover from the disease, which is proportional to the number of people who have it times some other constant the rate at which the susceptible population changes is given by the rate at which new infections occur. The rate at which people recover is given by the number of people who are currently infected times some constant. Now those constants that I described are the average interval by which an infected person will infect another susceptible person and the average time spent being infectious after which someone will recover or die. So on average, someone who's infected will infect other people by an interval of T sub S, and someone who is infected will stop being infectious on average after some amount of time T sub I. N is the total population, which is the sum of all of these three variables. Now this is a set of nonlinear differential equations, so it's not particularly interesting to strive for a compact analytical result. But we can gain some insight by knowing that the time derivative is the slope. So the slope of the people who are infected is proportional to how many people are currently infected times how many people are susceptible. And as time goes on, that slope increases because more people are infected until eventually the slope starts decreasing because the number of people who are susceptible begins to decrease. Now, in the early stages of an epidemic, which is right now, the number of susceptible people is approximately constant up here, and therefore the infections grow exponentially. So the rate at which new people get infected is essentially just proportional to how many people are currently infected. In the later stages of an epidemic, as the number of susceptible people decreases, the number of infections starts to taper off. Now let's have a closer look at what happens during the early stages of a pandemic, which again is what's happening right now. In the early stages of a pandemic, nobody has immunity and the susceptible population is essentially equal to the total population. As a result, we can simplify that first expression into this expression, a much simpler expression, which does have a clear closed form analytical solution, which is that the number of infected people is equal to how many people how many people are infected right now times something that's exponential with time. Now this can be expressed in the form of uh, the initial number of people infected times the exponent of t over tau, where tau, the time constant, is equal to the average spreading interval in parallel with the negative of the average time spent in being infectious and the number of people who have recovered or died is equal to the same expression except with a time shift that's equal to the average time spent being infectious. Now the number of people who are infected can also be expressed in this form where we introduce a variable called R0 which is the ratio of the average time spent being infectious divided by the average interval by which infectious people will spread the disease. And we call R0 the basic reproduction number or the average number of people that an infected person will infect. With this representation, the time constant is equal to the average time spent being infectious divided by R0 minus one. 
Here's a comparison of the R0 values for various diseases. The R0 value for this disease is somewhere around 2, which is comparable, maybe a little bit higher, than the R0 value for seasonal flu. However, unlike seasonal flu, which has a fatality rate of about 0.1%, this disease has a fatality rate that's much higher. Now this 4% this number, it's, it's been changing rapidly. It's really hard to know exactly what the fatality rate is because it depends on the quality of medical care and the way that things are being counted. For this disease, the value of R0 has been estimated to be about two and the doubling time has been estimated to be about five days. When you do the math, this means that the average time spent being infectious is about 7.2 days, and the average interval by which an infectious person will spread the disease is about every 3.6 days. Now I'll note, these are averages. Some individuals are super spreaders and can negate the effects of others. Also, because many people stay infectious longer than seven days, Quarantine protocols recommend a 14-day quarantine. With the number of infections growing exponentially, the number of people who are infected is going to be the number of people initially infected times 2 raised to the power of the number of days from today divided by the doubling period. With a little over 2,000 infections in the U.S. right now, that would mean multiplying by 2 to the power of the number of days divided by 5. Solving for the number of days that it would take to reach a certain number of infections, that would mean taking 5, multiplying by the logarithm base 2 of the number of infections that there will be that many days from now, divided by how many infections there are today. Now at the current rate, with a doubling period of five days, we can expect 28 days to have 100,000 infections in the US and 44 days to have 1 million infections. Now a quick note about exponentials, most people aren't comfortable with the natural exponent e, which is about 2.718, and the time constant tau, so they often prefer to describe it exponentials by their doubling time, t double. Now, you can easily translate between these two representations for exponential growth as e to the t over tau is equal to two, the, two to the t over t double, where the doubling period t double is equal to tau multiplied by the natural log of two. And the natural log of two is about 0 0.693. Right, so that's the power of exponentials. With only 2,200 infections today, you can have 100,000 infections in a month. R0 describes the average number of people that an infected person will spread the disease to. So if R0 is greater than one, then the disease will continue to spread exponentially. And the rate of that exponential growth depends on the value of R0. Here I'm plotting the number of infections after 20 days for various values of R0. Now, the doubling interval is proportional to the amount of time spent being infectious divided by R0 minus 1. So as a result, if you reduce R0 from 2 down to 1.5, which is only a 25% reduction, this increases the doubling time by a factor of 2, which buys precious time to prepare the medical system to respond to the disease. In other words, instead of taking one month to reach 100,000 infections, it'll take two months. Reducing R0 to 1.2, a 40% reduction, which is totally doable with social distancing, increases the doubling time by a factor of five. Reducing R0 by 50% down to R0 equals one means that on average, Every infected person will spread the disease once before recovering. And that looks like this curve right here, which is just a flat line. If you can achieve R0 equals 1, then the population of infected people will remain constant. It's not ideal to have this disease continuing to be present, but it's still really good.
And if you really want to stop a pandemic, you want R0 to be less than 1, meaning that on average, every infected person will spread the disease less than once before recovering. If you can get R0 to be less than 1, the population of infected people will decrease, and the disease will eventually disappear altogether as people recover. And that's illustrated by these curves right here. If R0 equals 0, which is the ideal case, then no new infections will occur whatsoever, and the disease will be eradicated as rapidly as possible at a rate governed by how long it takes to recover. Here's a view of how things will look like for our nation using the full SIR model for different values of R0. If R0 stays at 2 the way that it has been, then the peak number of infections that we'll have will occur after two and a half months and we'll have 46 million infections. However, if we can reduce R0 to 1.5, then the peak will happen after 5.3 months and it'll be a lower value of 19 million. If we further reduce R0 to 1.2, then we'll have 4.4 million infections after 11 months. So a key observation is that decreasing R0 decreases the peak number of infections as well as delaying it. Now, R0 is not an intrinsic property of a disease. It depends on human behavior. Cultures that hug and kiss as greetings, getting really close human contact, will have a higher R0, as each infected individual will have a higher probability of infecting another person. And cultures with a cool, distant approach will have a lower R0. Remember that R0 is equal to the average time spent being infectious divided by the average interval by which an infectious person will infect other people. The time spent being infectious is intrinsic to the disease, but the average interval by which someone who's infected will spread it depends on human behavior. Now, the average spreading interval is equal to 1 divided by R times P, where R is the number of interpersonal contacts that a person has per day, and P is the probability that each of these interactions will result in the, in the disease spreading. And so therefore, R0 is equal to the rate at which people interact times the probability that each of those interactions will spread the disease times the average time spent being infectious. You can observe that we can reduce R0 by reducing the frequency of interpersonal interactions and reducing the odds that each interaction will spread the disease. And these come in the form of social distancing, quarantine, hygiene, disinfecting, and so forth. Now, a final note, for many diseases, the probability of spreading the disease reduces in warm seasons, which it can offer some hope. But considering that this disease has been spreading in warmer climates, such as Singapore and Australia, for example, Tom Hanks got it in Australia, this is kind of optimistic. I wouldn't bet the barn on it. In the next, in the next video, we'll talk about why we should be concerned.